But my goal for today is to uh, fairly aggressively make our way through some material that will be helpful for uh, the final problem on that assignment. Um, if I had my druthers in terms of, uh, uh, of, of systematic presentation of the material, I might start with um, some, some basic background on nonlinearity first. Uh, but I'm really hoping to get you a set of actionable understanding that will allow you with confidence to take on that last assignment uh, before this lecture is out. And that will require me to, uh, to travel swiftly and live light on the land. And so I'm going to defer uh, at, the, at some pedagogical cost, a little bit of discussion about nonlinearity more generally until uh, after I, I get through the core material today, which likely will mean until um, our time together uh, first thing Thursday, um, where I'll sort of step back and, and look at nonlinearity. But today, we're going to be making uh, this important transition from linear models to nonlinear models, models whose rates of change uh, in terms of a chance per unit time, say a person progresses, is no longer going to be um, uh, independent of the uh, state of the system, but rather it will be dictated by um, the states of uh, not just this, of, of, of other stocks. So a person's chance, for example, of developing COVID-19 um, uh, is reflective of how many other infective people there are uh, around them. Um, and so the flow going from susceptibles on the one hand to infectives on the other will depend not merely on the number of susceptibles, whence that flow originates, but also on the number of infectives. And it's, it's this phenomenon of the interaction between these stocks that ends up having um, such a marked impact in terms of um, Many, uh, many specific um, ramifications. Uh, one of them uh, being that you have to essentially simulate a model. You can't just write down a formula for, for uh, how it's going to evolve over time. Um, another will be that there's multiple possible eventualities for this model. There's multiple places where it may be at balance. And uh, we're going to, to see a few of these items today within our discussion of um, infectious disease models as a case study. Now, if you pay attention today uh, carefully, uh, you will actually learn a lot of the core principles um, that, that relate to these infectious disease models that are so much in the news these days for uh, particularly for COVID-19. You will learn uh, key, uh, key points of reference for how to understand those models, um, key elements of understanding why those models work and how they are characterized. Um, elements of the formulation we'll see today are the defining elements of the formulation of those models you'll read about uh, in the literature for a large fraction of that, um, uh, of that set of models out there. And a lot of the models that are being used to advise policymakers worldwide, including within our own province. You will further learn principles that will help you understand uh, factors governing the ebb and flow, the waxing and the waning of infectious diseases such as COVID, but like countless others. And indeed, we'll, we'll have cameo appearances by other, other um, infectious diseases in the course of this very talk. So the principles that you'll see played out in a very modest, small way um, in these sort of toy little models are writ large in terms of their implications uh, for the world right now. And uh, this, this lecture will give you a leg up, not just in that assignment for or excuse me, so I'm at one question four, but also on um, in terms of understanding as an entree to this world of, of modeling infectious diseases. But it's also going to be a, a broader entry into the world of nonlinear models. Um, 
models which uh, exhibit this fundamental entangling that bedevils our, our, our intuition so often and uh, ends up um, uh, posing us uh, counterintuitive results that we wouldn't have expected um, off the seat of our pants or the top of our head. Okay, so we have a, um, uh, a, a high aspiration today and we have little time in which to deliver it. Uh, so I'm going to jump in right now to the slides. So uh, in today's presentation, uh, I'm going to be providing a, a bit of, a, of a, um, uh, an overview and orientation uh, in this area of, of aggregate uh, models of uh, dynamical systems for infectious diseases. And uh, we'll talk about some features of those models um, that distinguish them from models we've been looking at. And uh, you'll see some of those features here. Um, uh, they'll, they'll typically de be depicting, not surprisingly, uh, processes that involve infection. And this requires characterization of, of mixing between people in the population. Um, uh, it often includes uh, representation of development of immunity to an infection and potentially loss of immunity, something we know is troublingly uh, troublingly apparent for COVID-19 um, and, and has emerged from some recent studies. Um, often there's a multi-stage progression associated with uh, stages of infection. Uh, frequently rep we represent birth and migration into models, uh, sometimes aging and mortality, reflecting the fact that individuals at older ages, for example, are more susceptible to an infection or to the complications of that infection. Think that with COVID-19, with some of those in the oldest uh, age categories having orders of magnitude greater chance of requiring hospitalization or of mortality than, than younger individuals. Um, we sometimes represent um, the impacts of interventions here say uh, social distancing interventions, which might lower the contact rate, which will be a central parameter in these models, or other interventions involving things like mask use and hand washing, which might lower the probability per so-called discordant contact, contact between a infective and a susceptible, that the infection will be transmitted from the infective to that susceptible. That'll be um, denoted with the parameter beta. Um, in other cases, those interventions might involve faster case finding, and that will relate to flows from an undiagnosed um, stock, for example, to a diagnosed stock that takes them partly out of circulation, takes a, a diagnosed person out of circulation. We often will add many other layers on top of this. For example, right now, our models are being elaborated with representation of multiple strains or variants of infection. Um, of, and, and sometimes they have preferential mixing as our models do of people from different backgrounds, you know, younger people hanging out with younger people and, and older with older, uh, et cetera. Um, and many other components that, that often make their way into these models and make them a very rich area um, and an urgently needed area for modeling. But if we step back for a moment, um, step back from the sound and fury and, and, and take a look at some bigger characteristics of these models, um, we'll often find that regardless of condition, from condition to condition, regardless of whether you're dealing with COVID-19 or a lifelong chronic disease like, like TB or um, sexually transmitted infections or bloodborne infections, these models are, are characterized by uh, certain phenomena, certain types of behavior that's quite distinct and that marks them off very differently than the linear models we've been working with. A few of these features are instability and ability to grow very quickly. Think about the, the spread of the new variants from UK, B117, that just yesterday I heard was uh, the, the prevalence of B117 infection relative to other infections was, a, was expanding at a factor of 1.8 times per day. Um, and it doubles every 10 days. 
This is instability. It's, it's rushing onwards, not towards some sort of balanced equilibrium, but, um, but to exponentially grow the number of, in this case, of cases. Um, we have nonlinearity, which has diverse ramifications, including the fact that we can't analyze the effects of multiple interventions in isolation and expect to understand what the impact would be together. There's tipping points. There's points that we can just vaccinate enough people. Um, it may make all the difference and the infection will start to die out. Or with strong enough measures that uh, UK strain, which has been growing, uh, strong enough lockdown measures, it can be brought into abeyance and start to die down and eventually die out. There's oscillations and associated with tipping points, there's multiple points of balance in the system, often two points or more where the system's in balance. So in instability, we get this slight perturbation, you know, a person with COVID-19 coming into the Saskatoon airport can cause a big change in results. Um, you can get sudden growth. And this contrasts with a sort of goal-seeking behavior. And this was noted as early as, um, formally, as, as early as the 1700s. So this is from deaths from bubonic plague in London, showing this kind of characteristic curve that you'll find uh, so often within the infectious disease space. There's oscillations and delays, which are typically associated with stock and flow factors. Um, and uh, where uh, often there's uh, delays associated with building up a stock of infectives and depleting a stock of susceptibles that have just a massive impact on the dynamics. Um, for some infections like uh, childhood infectious diseases, you get these cycles absent vaccination, cycles whereby you'll have an outbreak, it'll drain the number of susceptibles, you know, young children say from one to four, typically or one to five. And the next few years, it will be at lower numbers. And then after a number of additional years, let's say a, a five years, you might get a further outbreak. And these cycles have been identified in things like uh, six to seven year uh, intervals. This is from measles in England and Wales, chickenpox in Saskatchewan, for example. Um, and we have other, uh, many other uh, conditions where, where these patterns are very clear, these, these cyclical patterns, okay? Um, we'll see them again in just a moment when I talk about tipping points. Uh, I noted the fundamental role of nonlinearity, and you'll see that that nonlinearity is reflected in the very structure of the models we'll use to characterize these, these systems. And indeed, that modelers worldwide canonicalize within their models, represent in their models. But one of the effects of it, the effects of it are, 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 uh, manifest, are manifold. And, and one of them is uh, we'll have these multiple basins of attraction and these tipping points. So you could see some more of these cycles here, but I wanna bring your attention to the tipping point at the end over here on the right, where the infection dies down due to the advent uh, in small numbers even of childhood infectious uh, disease vaccinations. In this case for red, uh, for measles and for mumps, okay? Um, vaccinating children in those youngest age groups deprives the infection of its of the, of the fuel it needs to burn. It deprives it of the uh, availability of susceptibles that it needs to spread to, to sustain itself. And you can get a real diminution of the number of individuals who are, who are sick with say chicken pox here. This is again from Saskatchewan um, in the mid fifties. And you see the number uh, of uh, incidents uh, associated with, with chicken pox, the chance per year that someone would, a child would get it, went up and up. Actually, this is anyone in the population would get it, went up and up, and then a collapse at the end due to vaccinations. This shows for pertussis uh, within our province as well. Um, with the warning sign there at the end, this is not to be taken for granted. And if too few children get vaccinated, it'll lead to these outbreaks associated with this um, infectious condition that's been in abeyance. Um, associated with, with uh, tipping points, though, are these uh, multiple equilibria. Often we have 
we have different equilibriums that a system can get into where it's stable, uh, where, where it can be stable in both sometimes. And, and often your goal is to nudge it from one of these basins to another, to drive it from being, for example, an endemic equilibrium to being a disease-free equilibrium, okay? And then through public health efforts to make a disease-free equilibrium be stable. So it won't be destabilized if that proverbial person comes into the airport with, uh, with this disease and imports it, it will still remain robust and stable. It won't just lead to a big outbreak. So often we'll have these um, multiple equilibria um, and for many types of conditions, they're associated with infections over the, the course of, of, of life and particularly concentrated in younger years. So for a very high, uh, high incidence infection, um, take um, common cold, for example, uh, often the assumption is that young children get exposed and uh, they build up an immune complement, a sort of set of cells and antibodies that protect them. And in many cases, like for measles or for chicken pox, et cetera, this confers decades worth of protection. Uh, in other cases like pertussis, it, it dies down. But you could see pre-vaccination, for example, for things like measles, um, uh, kids would, would tend to um, uh, be exposed in the first years of their life. This is the proportion who have experienced an attack of measles. And as they age, it's more and more likely that they will have gotten exposed to measles. So by age 10, it's almost a certainty. And that provided a certain, uh, uh, a certain level of damping on it that would lead to these cycles because uh, you get the kid infected in a certain cycle and then they're not subject to reinfection with, for measles uh, for decades. And so uh, it'll stay low for a number of years until the number of new, newborns coming into the population ends up uh, providing enough fuel for the fire. Here's TB given the absent or the, uh, the advent of um, effective uh, drugs and um, vaccination uh, uh, being widely used, BCG vaccination. Our province, ladies and gentlemen, was a, was a worldwide leader for TB um, uh, and its uh, programs were, were emulated worldwide. Um, You'll note the tipping points here in chickenpox of which I spoke earlier. And it's quite striking. For example, small differences can push something over the brink from one tipping point to another. We have these multiple basins of attraction where for example, um, if we have fewer infectives initially, we'll have uh, the, and a certain number of healthcare workers, we may be able to contain a bug and it will start here, up here in the upper right, and it will travel. This is what's called a state space diagram. We have susceptibles on the x-axis and infectives on the y-axis, the vertical axis. And starting with a situation with lots of susceptibles and um, this number of, of infectives, 1400, we'll get a slight spread, but then it will be brought under control and we will see as the fuel for the fire is used up and, and they can um, keep it capped in terms of the number of people getting infected, the number of infectives will fall. That's why this is going down here. Number of infectives is going down. And then at some point, infectives will, um, will become extraordinarily small and susceptibles will grow as people recover and, um, and, ret and um, return to a state of, uh, of susceptibility. By contrast, if we, don't have an, uh, if we have too many infectives or if we don't have enough healthcare workers, you can get it heading off in an adverse direction to, a, a, to an endemic equilibrium where it's like, this is like a mountain range. If you put a drop of water here, it goes down to the, you know, to the Pacific and place just uh, a kilometer away, it will flow to Hudson Bay and it will flow up here to a situation where the bug stays circulating with lots of infectives remaining in place. 
So I'd like to make this more concrete. Those are some features of infectious disease models, but I'd like to make it concrete with an eye towards informing not just your conceptual understanding of this material, not just providing an overview, but to enable you with respect to that final problem of assignment one. So here I'd like to consider partitioning the population into three categories that are uh, very well, you know, uh, almost um, uh, canonized within the infectious disease modeling world, S, I, and R. And in fact, these models go by the name SIR models. Sometimes other letters are put in like SEIR to indicate, um, for example, the presence of a of exposed compartment reflecting people are in a latent state of infection. So here we have it, susceptibles uh, here, infectives and recoveries, okay? Um, and in general, we'll typically have a, a situation something like this. Susceptibles will through getting infected flow into infectives. And then infective individuals will through a process of recovery and sometimes of adverse outcomes such as death will flow out. Here we just have recovery and we have some mean time with disease um, beyond which they go to recovery state. Does anyone recognize this construct here? Please, uh, when you speak up, uh, please also put your name in the chat so I could see who's uh, volunteering information. What's this construct here with this mean time with disease, recovery and infectives? That's a what? First order first delay? delay? Yeah, it's a first Sorry, order no. delay right there. Um, so it should be familiar to you, but this is gonna be unfamiliar. And in fact, um, I, I, I really should have emphasized between infectives and fractional prevalence, there's a link here. So force of infection and indeed incidence, well, actually incidence particularly is gonna depend on, on both susceptibles and infectives, and we'll see this. So I'd like to talk about each of these names here. It's quite common within this field to have standardized names a name which is used most commonly for susceptible individuals is S. You'll sometimes see it referred to as X. Um, I is used to denote a number of infective individuals or infectious individuals. These are people who are not only infected, but they can actually spread the infection. And you can use infective and infectious in an in a, um, interchangeable fashion here. Uh, in some models, in many models, these are just one stock, one, one particular compartment. But in other models, you might have many such stocks, okay? And, and maybe you'll have a stock for early stage and late stage because something like COVID-19 complications only come after some time with the infection. And you wanna capture that memory, memory full property that it takes time to develop it. Um, you're not at equal chance develop it as soon as you get uh, on a per day basis, as soon as you get infected, far from it, you need some time to remain in it. So you'll have a uh, second order delay, for example, uh, early stage and late stage infection. In other case, you may have asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals. Indeed, this is something you'll, you'll basically see a variant of in our COVID-19 models. And then finally, there'll be a total size of the population that'll be denoted N. Okay, so this is the basic structure. And here you'll see this dependence. So we have incidents here. We have um, ultimately incidents, the, the number of people per unit time who flow from susceptibles to infectives will be depending on some constants, but most, most notably, it depends on both susceptible and infective. And that stands in contrast, ladies and gentlemen to what we saw with first order delays um, and even higher order delays um, where any given flow depended, yes, the value, number of people coming down that flow depended on a stock, but it was the stock whence it came, the stock from which it emanated, um, in this case, recovery on infectives. Here we have incidents depending on susceptibles. If there aren't any susceptibles, there's not gonna be any new cases of infection. But it further depends on infectives, the presence of infectives. In fact, what's here is it's upstream stock by chance. And, uh, and that's going to lead to a very different dynamics than what we see for forced order delays. 
It's not going to lead to stability. It's going to lead, in fact, to instability. Okay. So, um, for anyone who'd like to uh, experiment with this, um, uh, you're welcome to do so uh, with some parameters. Um, for example, we'll denote this contacts per susceptible as C. Um, and that's actually contacts per day per susceptible. I stand corrected or per unit time uh, per susceptible. Uh, we'll denote that as C. Here I said, okay, month. Uh, beta is uh, the term for this per contact risk of infection. And that's per contact between, per discordant contact, contact between an infective and a susceptible. So that's a 4% chance of, of transmission um, every time susceptible is, is in contact with an infective. Um, there's some average duration of infectiveness, mu, which should be given as 10 months. I should have written that out. Birth and death rate I had as zero and, and initial infectives I had uh, as one here and everything else is zero, okay? And we'll see some of the dynamics from this, okay? Now I wanna emphasize these, these more. These, these are absolutely central parameters and this contacts per susceptible per unit time is absolutely key. And, and it's important to understand this is the number of contacts a susceptible has per unit time say per day or per week or per month with anyone, okay? Um, susceptible or infected or, or already, uh, excuse me, susceptible, infected, recovered, any of those. Um, how many contacts do you have overall? Okay, and we'll see how we take into account that only some of those contacts are infective in just a moment. The other, the other key parameter I mentioned is beta. This is this per infective, with susceptible contact per discordant contact transmission probability. And it's this probability of, of transmission from, a, from an infective to a susceptible. Okay, now we're gonna be getting to the heart of a few of the quantities that will play a big role in your assignment, but will further play, a, play a, they do play an outsized role worldwide in characterizing COVID-19 and countless other infectious conditions. Okay, and I'd like to talk through the intuition behind some of these terms, okay? Um, so we're going to see the equations here end up having some terms within them. Uh, there's gonna be certain repeated terms like I over N, for example. Uh, which are going to crop up or C times I over N. And I want you to understand uh, where those come from, okay? If, if you reflect on the fact that I is the number of infectives in the population, N is the total, infect, the total number of people in the population, I over N reflects the fraction of the population that are infected, that, are, that can transmit the infection, okay? Um, and as we'll see, in these models, we'll take the convenience assumption uh, that this fraction of the overall population that's infective um, carries also through to what fraction of our contacts are infective if we're circulating as a susceptible. Um, now there's various elaborations of this. Maybe you'll only compute it on a per age group uh, basis, for example, rather than for the whole population. Um, but it's an important assumption that comes out of these models um, that uh, you, you make this, um, this translation from the overall numbers in the model to what each person encounters on average. And it's sometimes called mean, mean field uh, type models. That will be in contrast to, for example, what we see with agent-based models where we'll actually break out in a particular individual's circumstance, their network, for example, or their spatial position. And we'll be able to reason about not just, uh, we'll be able to reason about how many people they're in contact with, not just on the basis of the fraction of overall people that are infected, but how many people in their particular network are infected or in their particular region of, of the city or what have you. But for now, just bear in mind, I over N, you should immediately realize, oh, that's just a fraction of the population that's infected. Okay, now I'm building this up 
to the defining canonical equation or formula, I should say, that's used in infectious disease modeling. So this slide is key, okay? Um, it will be tested. I can tell you elements of this will make their way into the final exam, okay? Um, they're certainly made, already made their way into your assignment for Friday. So I over N fractured the whole population that's infected. C times I over N needs further elaboration because remember what C is. Can anyone tell me what C is? Uh, the contacts per susceptible? Yeah, per unit time, unit right? Time. Like say per day or per month or per week, whatever your unit of time is, that's right. So the idea is, look, I'm a given susceptible. I have C contacts per, let's say per day with anyone. Now C times I over N will give the number of contacts that I'll tend to have with infective people per day on average. We're, we're again going from the, the general case, you know, of people in the population as a whole, I over N are infective, and we're kind of translating that to, to, to something closer to an individual circumstance, you know, saying, look, I have maybe 50% of the whole population is infective. I have contact with 100 people per day um, at some level. And so, how many, how many infectives might I have contact with on average per day? It's 100, that's my 100 per day with anyone, times 0.5 or 50% uh, because half the people out there in general are, are infected. So if I'm a, this susceptible, having contact with 100 people per day total, and in a, in, in, a, in a city or context where half the people are infected, then on average, I probably contact about 50 people per day who are infected. Now, each of those contacts we treat as conferring an independent chance of infection of beta, okay? So maybe it's 1% chance per contact. You know, I'm standing in line and Tim Hortons next to someone. Um, maybe I, um, you know, unwisely go to, uh, uh, to a uh, to a to a gym and 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 mix with people and each of those people are nearby me on the treadmill, you know I have a, a one percent chance of getting infection uh, from each of them, and so if we if we multiply c times i over n the average number of infectives that come in contact with the susceptible times beta, we'll get a, a an approximation to a to a probability a given susceptible will be infected per unit time. If I have contact with 50 people per day who are infected, um, and each of those confers a 1% chance, then if you kind of simplify the situation, you ignore the fact that I can only get infected from one, um, we have something like a 50% chance that I'm gonna get infected per day. And it turns out this tends to be a really good approximation if beta is very, very small, for example. Um, and uh, here, therefore, this is, 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 is quantifying for a given susceptible in the model and that stock of susceptibles, what's their chance per day that they will get infected? Chance per unit time. And we call that the force of infection. And this is a, a very important term. You'll see it in our reports daily to our stakeholders. Uh, you'll see it um, talked about sometimes in particular contexts. Uh, you even saw it in that previous slide uh, from here with, with the force of infection, okay? So this is a, a, it's a hazard rate. It's a probability per unit time that I get infected. And that will be what is multiplied by the susceptibles. For each susceptible, they have that chance per unit time of getting infected. Think of it as almost like the alpha um, that applies to them. But instead of alpha being a fixed quantity, like 1% per day, this is a quantity that varies uh, with circumstance, with the number of infectives, for example. So it's like a varying alpha. And in fact, we, we denote that force of infection with lambda, the, the Greek letter lambda, and you'll sometimes see that. Okay, okay. So, so the key equation within infectious disease modeling, the fundamental equation you'll see 
within these mathematical models of infectious disease again and again and again um, uh, derives uh, from, from exactly this sort of reasoning. And the key formula for it is, is as given here, okay? It's, it's S times the force of infection. This is the number of susceptibles who will be infected per unit time is treated as the number of susceptibles times this force of infection, this chance per unit time that draws them down from susceptible to infected. And the reasoning of that was given here. This is the force of infection, the probability per unit time a given susceptible will get infected. We multiply that times the number of susceptibles and that gives us the total number, total number of susceptibles infected per unit time, okay? Um, and you'll notice that this term is different than what we saw with first order delays or second order delays, for example. It's different than what we saw with these target followers and so on. Here, it, we don't merely have S times some fixed alpha chance per unit time. Instead, this probability of advancing per unit time depends itself on a state variable, on a stock, I, okay? And that is this nonlinear term that makes all the difference in the world, okay? Um, now, as we commented last time, this value that's multiplied by S is, is a probability per unit time of advancing, but it's also equal to one over the mean time until they're infected. So remember, we saw that last time, right? If we have an average duration of infectiousness, we could just as easily take the reciprocal of that one over that and treat it as a average duration of infectiousness, let's say is measured in, in days. The per day chance of advancing would be one over that. Um, that'd be our alpha. So, so here for first order delay, we could specify this as infective divided by the average duration, or we could specify it as infective times some alpha where alpha is one over the infectious duration. It comes out in the wash, right? It's the same thing mathematically. Um, it's, it's precisely the same. So it is with force of infection. You can have a force of infection that's greater than one and it just means your average time, your average number of days susceptible be less than one. You're, you know, as soon as, very quickly when you come into the susceptible compartment, you'll be drawn out. That force of infection could be, could be much bigger than one. It means you're very likely to be, to be infected quickly. Um, or it could be less than one. You might spend several days on average in the susceptible stock before getting infected. But the key point is it does depend on the number of infectives, okay? Um, now, this force of infection is one of the key factors we look to to give us an understanding of, of dynamics associated with these systems. But there's another quantity that is of equal in conceivably greater significance. And that quantity is the fraction that remain susceptible, the fraction of the entire population, that's N, that remains susceptible. So if we have an entire population that's divided between these three stocks, and we have a total population size of N, the fraction that remains susceptible will just be S over N, right? It turns out, that this has foundational importance in terms of the evolution of the system. Foundational reflecting the fact that it tells us how much fuel there is for this, for this fire to spread within the population, this fire associated with infection, okay? And it's so important, we give it a name. The name is F, it's the fraction of the population that's susceptible, it's denoted with the shorthand of F, okay? Um, and it is an incredibly important quantity when we reason about things such as when the infection uh, will no longer be able to sustain itself, when we'll reach so-called herd immunity due to natural infection. But it, 
but it also gives us the sense. Uh, it turns out we can specify um, how much, how many doses of vaccine we'll need to distribute based on F as well. Okay. Um, now uh, I want to walk through why it's so critical. Okay. Um, remember that the key formula here to advance someone from S to I, from from to get them infected is S times this force of infection, right? This chance per unit time they'll get infected. And I told you it was this formula here. You should recognize that. And you should be able to understand why it is. C is the total number of contacts per day those susceptibles have with anyone. So C times I over N is the total number of contacts they have per day with infectives. And we multiply times beta, that's the chance per day that they'll get infected. And you multiply all of that times S and you'll get the number of people being infected per day. But we can rephrase this. I mean, after all, this is, you know, subject to the, to the basic rules associated with algebra um, and through um, uh, symmetry, uh, we can rearrange it. And for example, put the S on the inside and the I on the outside and get something like this, I times C times S over N times beta. Um, and this is kind of saying how many, for each infective I, how many susceptibles will they infect on average per unit time? That's what C times S over N times beta is. And let's walk through the reasoning again. So I'm an infective, suppose. Aren't you glad you're, you're not meeting with me in person? Um, I'm an infective. And suppose I have contact with C people per unit time in total, say 100 people per day. I go around, you know, and I'm, I'm uh, engaged in cruising around and I, and I see 100 people per day um, uh, at the point of the, where the infection could be spread. And suppose that only 50% of the people around me though, of those 100 people I see per day, maybe only 50% remain susceptible. So then I've, I've actually met up with 50 people per day who are susceptibles. Okay, and that's gonna be key because if I'm gonna transmit to anyone, it's gotta be to a susceptible. And then for each of those people, I have some chance beta, say 0.01 of transmitting the infection. So that will give me a, you know, a, 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 a chance per day of, of 0.5 of transmitting to anyone or equally much so 0.5 people on average per day to whom I transmit, right? I'm meeting up 50 susceptibles per day. Each of them I have a chance of transmitting to of, of uh, one divided by 100 or 0.01. So on average, I infect 0.5 people per day. And that's what this term represents from the perspective of an infected. We could also rephrase that, noting that this is the name for S over N. F, we denote it as F. This is C times beta times F, okay? Um, and one of the key insights that comes from this, not to be understated, is the fact that, look, the fewer infectives there are, excuse me, excuse me, I take that back in a most uh, wholesome fashion. The fewer susceptibles there are, the smaller S is, the fewer people a given infective will be able to infect. If S is just one-tenth of the population, that each infected will be infecting one-tenth the number of people they could have if everyone around them, everyone else but themselves were susceptible. So S throttles the ability for infectives to efficiently infect people. As S goes down, the number of susceptible people it becomes harder and harder for a given infective to, to find people to infect. It becomes harder and harder for them to infect people. It means fewer and fewer people will be infected by them on a per day basis. And we can think of this very compellingly. And it's a very good analogy, actually. It's a, it's a very uh, uh, straightforward and a very enduring and um, durable and, and uh, 
uh, flexible uh, and at the same time deep analogy, we can think of the susceptibles as being fuel for the fire. Okay, um, if we deprive a you know a given flame of a fuel in which to spread, it will spread less. Okay. Um, and fire needs, just as fire needs fuel to spread, infection needs susceptibles to spread, okay? And it's this presence of susceptibles here in this equation that limits how much infection can spread. Think even about the level of, of yourself in a household. If you, God forbid, had COVID-19 and you live with two other roommates in your home, um, it may spread to them but it can only spread so far within the home. And if you're isolating, then it's not gonna spread to any others because the number of susceptibles is zero. So if we have a model structure like this, susceptibles, infectives, and recovered, we'll give these things nice short names. And these are the equations that come out. We have this flow into the susceptible stock over here on the left that you know, we'll just specify exogenously. It's externally specified, it's pre-specified. It doesn't depend on model state, it doesn't depend on a stock. And then this is the infection flow, C. And remember S dot means the rate of change of S, how quickly it's rising. If it's, if it's 10, for example, per day, it'll mean the number of susceptibles is rising by 10 per day. If it's negative, 10, it means it's shrinking by 10 per day. It's going down by 10 per day. Same thing with uh, I dot and R dot, okay? Um, we have this flow out of susceptibles and into infectives, so it tends to be repeated here. And this is this flow of recoveries out of infectives and into recoveries. And you'll recognize this as a first order delay. It's just this I divided by mu, I divided by mu. That's that standard form of a first order delay when mu is a is a, a mean number of mean amount of time they spend in the stock i but note again these terms which i've been um telling you about c times i over n times beta collectively that quantity that's then multiplied by s that c times i over n times beta is the force of infection it's a chance per unit time a susceptible will be infected. Um, and it drives both the flow out of susceptibles and the flow in of infectives because S is the fuel for the fire. Once people are infected, they become infective and they start to be able to propagate the flame to others. You'll notice that this term, this key term, this defining term of infectious disease models built with compartments like this is that it's nonlinear. We have an S times an I. You don't see that for this term, right, with I. No, there's, there's no multiplication of it by another state variable. Um, but here we see it, S times I. And as I said last time, that tells us it takes two to tango. In order to spread the infection, you need both an I and you need an S. If I is zero, this term will be zero. Doesn't matter what S is. If S is zero, this term will be zero. Doesn't matter what I is. You need both susceptibles to be infected and infectives to infect them in order to have anyone proceeding down here. And that's very different than with a first order delay where all we need is People and and I uh, the 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 stock once it comes the, the the stock from which it emanates. Here we need people in that stock for sure, but we also need people to infect them. Okay, and this term has huge ramifications. So for a linear system, we have something um, something of this sort. We have uh, x dot equals f of x. Okay, and uh, it turns out we can represent it in matrix notation. If you if you take A as a matrix and X as a, a vector, um, a vector of state variables, like a vector with S in the first component, I in the second, R in the third, we could actually write down in a pithy way a, um, a characterization of a stock and flow model um, uh, using uh, the notation X, X, uh, this little arrow for it means it's a vector. 
dot, meaning the rate of change of them, okay? Now this would be for a linear system. We can actually represent it potentially with a bit of change of variables to reflect the fact we have a kind of an offset. Um, we have like people coming in through M. We can represent it in this sort of way, X dot equals AX, okay? It's, it's, it's linear in X. It's, this is why I call it linear algebra, right? You're multiplying a matrix times a vector. It's a linear combination of the elements of that vector that give, that drive then the rates of change. And that's what we had with linear systems, regardless of whether it was a first order delay, whether it was a reinforcing loop, regardless of whether it was a balancing loop, whether it was target following phrasing of first order delays, regardless of whether it was an aging chain, they all fell into this category. They were all linear. Any given flow depended just on a single state variable, a single stock in a linear way, multiplying it by some sort of constant given fancy Greek names in some cases. Uh, if we were to represent this in a, in, a, um, in a matrix form, what we'd see is SIR here. And we will be moving towards doing this to derive some some quantities, uh, some like the equilibria associated with these models. So here we have uh, susceptibles affected recovered in a vector. And we want to understand how S dot, I dot, and R dot change. Well, we go back to these equations, right? Um, and we can find their corresponding equations here uh, in this matrix, for example. So to find out how S dot changes, well, S dot is equal to M plus some function of SI and R. And that function is going to be S times minus C times I over N times beta. That's exactly what this, this line says. Here we have M coming into to S and we have S times C times I over N times beta. So that's exactly what we see here in this matrix. And remember how matrix multiplication by a vector works. Conceptually, you could think of it as, as putting the vector up here and you get S times this term plus I times this term times that term plus R times uh, this term. And, and then you add this in, you'll get S dot. For I dot, we'll be dealing with this plus this uh, entry from the matrix times S plus this uh, entry times I plus this entry times R. And that will give us I dot. And that's exactly what this, uh, this formula tells us, okay? But the notable thing is these matrix entries, which would be constant for a linear system in a situation like this, this is a fixed matrix, a matrix with which doesn't change over time or which doesn't change in, uh, based on the state. Now it depends on I, it's nonlinear, okay? Now that may not seem like a big deal, but it is gigantic and widespread ramifications that are both pr at once practical. They are uh, significant methodologically and uh, they complicate our analyses. They mean that we can't often rely on intuition and uh, they point us to opportunities as well as to risks. Opportunities say to achieve a tipping point and risks associated with uh, lock-in behavior where if you don't intervene early, the system could be locked into a state that's much, much harder to change later. Think about, for example, patterns of addiction where heading off an addiction early on may be a fairly small matter, but once someone's life has become disordered, fallen apart, uh, they developed um, uh, uh, lost pro-social relationships and, and are uh, enmeshed in a world uh, of, of, uh, of turmoil with others in similar patterns, trying to pick up the pieces later is so much more complicated. Uh, heading off the danger of strains is relatively straightforward if you uh, know to plan for it. But if uh, you're dealing with uh, with a context where you're not planning ahead for it, 
picking up the pieces later will be ever so more more uh, problematic and trouble and and um, uh, and involves so much more work and loss. Um, there's so many cases in life where, uh, uh, as we say, a stitch in time saves nine, and so it is with these sorts of models. Um, so with nonlinearity, we have this uh, phenomenon that um, while uh, for a linear function, we'd expect it to be able to understand its behavior on a system as a whole um, by taking it apart and understanding its behavior into pieces of the system. Uh, if we have a linear function, f of a, f of quantity a plus b, um, with a linear function, this is guaranteed to be f of a plus f of b. Think about doubling a value, for example. If you have if the function just doubles the value of its argument, that's linear, right? You're multiplying two times whatever it's given. We have two times A equals B equals two times A plus two times B, right? Um, very straightforward. And given a linear system phrased as a dynamic system, phrased as in this sort of way as stocks and flows, for example, where the rates of change uh, or some function, linear function of the current state of the system, then we expect that here F is linear. That's what it means to be a linear system. And so the rate of change of X plus Y together, think a situation where we have some susceptibles, that's X and some infectives, that's Y. You, you combine them together and it's gonna be the same as if you just simulate it with infectives separate from susceptibles. That doesn't work for infectives and susceptibles. It did work for first order delays. Um, if we had multiple first order delays in a system. We could simulate each in isolation, sum up the results and get an understanding of how it behaves for the whole system, okay? Um, so in this case, it breaks down for infectious disease models because um, we have this term C times I over N times beta times S, this term that multiplies S and I, okay? And here, um, well, for linearity, we would expect if we only simulate the model with susceptibles and recovered on the one hand, and then separately we simulate it with just infectives, for a linear system, we would expect the two to add together to give us its behavior with respect to all the people, S and I and R. And it doesn't work that way because uh, the system has this, this formula involving infection. Uh, and as a result, if you have S and zero infectives in R, you're gonna get zero infections. If you have a situation where you have zero susceptibles, even if you have a lot of infectives, you're gonna get zero infections. So you sum those together and you're gonna get something that's profoundly different than if you consider the susceptibles and the infectives together, because there you're going to be getting this term being non-zero. So this is not a linear system because we have S times I there. It just stands and grabs us, uh, you know, stands out and punches us in the face. Okay. so. Um, Within these systems, we're going to have some rich, uh, rich feedbacks, and it's worth emphasizing that these systems can be very fruitfully understood in terms of those basics of feedbacks and um, and accumulations. Okay, um, and we'll be seeing this um, uh, later in a step-by-step -step fashion, but I want to see some of the patterns that come out of this. Okay. Um, so, so here uh, we could depict this sort of um, situation and this sort of spread of infection as consisting of a set of feedback loops. Most notably, we have new infectives lead to new, new infections lead to new infectives, which leads to more contacts between susceptibles and infectives and leads to new infections. That's the, that's the feedback in which you know, people focus for COVID, right? Um, you can get infective, infected, in which case you'll then become infective and can spread it to others. And round and round the cycle goes um, in this vicious sort of way. 
Um, by contrast, there are several balancing loops here. This is a reinforcing loop, hence it's plus, right? Um, a given perturbation of one of these factors, say introducing uh, a new infective into this population will ripple around and further amplify that original change or lead to even more infectives. That's why it's a reinforcing loop. By contrast, there's balancing loops, right? We have, for example, susceptibles. Um, well, let's take new infections. The occurrence of a new infection will tend to drain the number of susceptibles. And by draining the number of susceptibles, we'll reduce the number of contacts that are possible in, 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 in a net way between susceptibles and infectives. Notice that there's a plus there. I emphasized this before, but it, it bears noting again. When you're thinking about this link, um, you may ask, well, why is there a plus? If I say reducing susceptibles, we reduce the number of contacts. Well, what this plus is telling you is that those are occurring in the sort of same direction. So if we, if we increase the number of susceptibles, all other things being equal, contacts between susceptibles. So if we increase susceptibles, all other things being equal, contacts between susceptibles and infectives will increase, holding everything else constant compared to the value it otherwise would have had. By contrast, if we lower susceptibles, we will lower the number of contacts between susceptibles and infectives uh, compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all other things being equal. So this is indeed a plus, but when we think about the loop, if we think about, okay, there's more new infections that lowers the number of susceptibles. By lowering the number of susceptibles, we lower the number of contacts between susceptibles and infectives. And in turn, that ends up lowering the number of new infections. This is a balancing loop. This is a loop that's uh, self-limiting. It, 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 or it, 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 it limits itself. It drives towards a state of stability with zero susceptibles. Um, whereas the fewer susceptibles, the fewer new infections, and, it's, uh, and it ends up limiting uh, the impact of new infections, pushes back against those new infections by changing things in a way that lead to fewer new infections. There's also a, 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 a feedback associated with new recoveries, right? As, as infectives go up, we tend to have uh, recoveries occurring, which draws down the infectives. So there's limiting, there's, there's these uh, limiting uh, loops associated with both of these, uh, these phenomena. With infectious diseases, one of the things, and the primary thing that helps us bring them under control is exactly these dynamics. People get infected, eventually recover. People who, and therefore are for some period of time not, infect, not susceptible to infective again. And most importantly, we deplete the number of susceptibles. That's depleting, remember, exactly this term here. We reduce the amount of fuel that's unburnt and therefore we reduce the amount the fire can spread, okay? So the induced dynamics in a closed population, a population that does not have new people coming into it uh, is as follows, okay? Um, we, um, so I'm gonna set M to be zero here. We'll be looking at a case where we do have people coming in, but for the moment, let's consider a case with where we have a closed population. No one is entering the population, no one is leaving. There's a total population of size N that, N that remains constant throughout the, the entire time horizon of concern. Okay, so S plus I plus R is N, and we get people being infected and recovering. And this is what we'll see. We'll start with a high susceptible population, okay? and. That susceptible population will initially be almost everyone in the population. So it provides lots of fuel around each of the few infectives that are around. Each of those infectives will be surrounded almost entirely by susceptibles. So those infectives will spread infection like gangbusters. It'll just grow and grow and grow. One infective will beget, will beget two, will beget Four, and, and you know, it'll go from one to two to four, it'll double. Just like 
the number of cases of a new strain, P117, in the states is doubling every 10 days. That's how you, that's how these things spread and it doubles and it will spread in an exponential way, a way that, that leads to this kind of doubling phenomenon. It's log linear um, and uh, it'll, it'll be rising as e to the alpha t where alpha is greater than zero, okay? So it's rising. Meanwhile, though, these infectives are not coming from nowhere. I mean, they're, they're depleting the number of susceptibles. Um, and eventually some of those infectives will start to recover, okay? Um, that's, uh, that's this number here. And the recoveries will, um, will rise. And eventually we'll, we'll see a plateau in return. And I'd like to, to talk about these stages. So initially, look, each infective is gonna be extremely efficient. They're gonna infect basically everyone around them because S over N is essentially one. S is essentially N. Everyone is susceptible essentially. And so they're gonna infect C times beta people on average, each infective um, for each time unit, for each time unit. This is like the maximum possible rate. They're extremely, in, um, extremely efficient. And over the course of their infection, if their infection lasts time mu, mu days, let's say, and each, each day they infect C times beta people. In other words, they're infecting C times beta per people per day. You multiply that by mu, you get C times beta times mu, and that will be the basic reproductive number at that initial time. The total number of people they infect before they recover in a totally susceptible population. That's what we're dealing with here. And that's called the basic reproductive number, a basic reproductive constant, although it's a somewhat of a misnomer. Now, in the short term, the infectives are gonna grow very quickly. I mean, they're surrounded by so many susceptibles. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna grow quickly. And really it's this loop that's dominating. This loop here, new infections breed new infections, which lead to more contacts, which lead to new infections. The susceptibles are going down, but it's, it's pretty small potatoes uh, at that, that stage. Because um, they're, the infectives are still overwhelmingly, they're just living in an ocean of susceptibles. Um, now, over time though, there's uh, more infectives and fewer susceptibles. So there's fewer susceptibles uh, over time. Once the number of infected start to become quite a large fraction of the population, the number of susceptibles around them is, is notably less than one. Um, and uh, this means that each of those infectives is gonna have a, a somewhat harder time infecting susceptibles. They're gonna, instead of everyone being around them infective, or sorry, susceptible, um, maybe only half. And so they have to work twice as hard, you know, twice as long to infect the same number of people, right? Um, so they're going to be infecting people, but but somewhat slower. And you, you'll see it, it, it doesn't grow quite at that exponential rate anymore. It starts to be, starts to be bent. Moreover, many of the infectives at that point start recovering. And, and hence this black curve starts going up, which for reasons that uh, I'm not sure why I started at uh, not zero, but it starts going up. Um, so many of the infectives start recovering. And so there's, you know, people leaving the eye stock as well as coming in. And so the eye stock is gonna be growing less quickly because now not only do we not have growing numbers of people coming in, but we have people leaving. And remember what changes the rate of change at the eye stock, it's the net change is inflow minus outflow. Okay, um, now at some point though, we reach this tipping point and, and this is a key tipping point. Man, if, if all my colleagues in the Ministry of Health understood this, my life would be a lot easier, ladies and gentlemen. At this tipping point, there's two things that apply, okay? Two things that apply. First of all, at the aggregate level, for the infectious population to be flat, to not be going up, 
and not be going down anymore. What do we know from basic principles of stocks and flows? If I isn't going up, it isn't declining, it's staying constant. What do we know must be the case? Put your name there. Equal? Yeah, what's equal? The inflow and the outflow? In, the inflow and the outflow know. are equal. They've got to be. The rate of water coming into your tub has to be the same as it going out for, a, for it to just be staying constant. So, so at that point, the rate of incidence equals the rate of recoveries. And that's notable. We're not being, we're not getting people infective any faster than their recovery. So the number of infective stays constant. But from the level of a particular individual, particular infective, what this is telling us is the number of people that they infect over the entire course of their illness is equal to one. They're just replacing themselves when they recover. If I'm an infective and I, I'm working to infect people around me, if I infect two people by the time I recover, I will have left the world a worse place, right? I'm, there are more people infective after I recover. And if that person infects two people, they're gonna, the number is going to be going up by the time I recover. But if by the time I recover, I infect just one person, I've, I've sort of appointed my replacement, right? And the number, total number of, in, of infectives is not going to go up anymore. I'm, I'm just replacing myself. It's, um, uh, it's just going to stay constant. And that's what's happening there. And we term this, I, I talked with you earlier, so like the crown jewel, some of the crown jewels of, of mathematical epidemiology you're learning here. Remember I said early on, each of these infectives infects C times S over N times beta people, which at that point was C times beta per unit time. And if we multiply the total length of time they're infected, mu, we get the basic reproductive C times beta times mu. But in general, C times S over N times beta will not equal C beta. That's only at the very beginning when everyone's susceptible, it equals C beta. In general, if you multiply the uh, C times S over N times beta tells for a given infective at the current time, given that there's S people around who are susceptible still, how many people do they infect per unit time, per say day before they recover? And C times S over N times beta times mu, the length of time they're infected, the length of time, that's going to give the effective reproductive number, not the basic. The basic is if they're surrounded by all susceptibles. Effective reproductive number gives at the current time, how many people is a given infective going to infect before they recover? And that's C times S over N times beta times mu, because mu is the length of time and infective is the number of days they're, they, they remain infected. Um, and so at this, at this point, this, this plateau, the effective reproductive number, C times S over N times beta times mu has to equal one, because I, I've gotten one replacement by the time I recover, okay? Um, now, after that point, there's a lot which is occurring. Now, now it's starting to drain faster than it's coming in. That's why I is going down because the outflow is greater than the inflow. Before this peak, the inflow was greater than the outflow. At the peak, the inflow equaled the outflow. After the peak, the outflow is greater than the inflow. And so it, it, it's, it's going down. And that leads to a virtuous cycle for several reasons. Number one, there's fewer infectives around to infect people. And so the number of new people coming into infected will be even smaller. I is going down. And so it's gonna be fewer and fewer people getting infected because you know, those, those remaining eyes are getting fewer and fewer and they're gonna be infecting fewer people overall. So that's gonna drive that, that down even further. But other things are occurring too. After all, even more susceptibles are, are getting drained. And already it wasn't sustainable. And with susceptibles coming down even further, it will further this, um, this decline, okay? So the declining number of infectives and susceptibles will lead to lower and lower rates of infection. You get it dying out. 
Okay. Um, you get it dying down like that. Um, uh, and at that point, what's really dominating is this, this loop, this, this new recovery loop. So during this initial phase, sorry, during this initial phase, what was dominating was this loop. Um, sort of around the peak, what's more dominating is this one. And then later on, what's particularly dominating is just draining the number of infectives. It takes time to drain the, the infectives there. And, and that's associated with this recovery loop. So what you see is a shifting dominance of loops, which is characteristic of these system dynamics models. Uh, these feedbacks compete with each other, interplay, but often one is dominant at a given time. And the dominance shifts over the course of the, the outbreak. Okay, um, you know, so a few key points here um, uh, with respect to, to this sort of situation. Um, the minimum value of the stock of infectives, um, so the, the, the minimum associated with, um, uh, with, with this set of infectives, um, excuse me, um, yeah, so this should be, um, right, let, let me first describe the other one. The maximum of the stock of infectives occurs at a, at a different time than the maximum of incidence. So the maximum number of people getting infective actually occurs at a different point than when the infectives are, are at their maximum, okay? Um, remember that the maximum of incidence of people getting infected depends on both susceptibles and ports of infection. So it does depend, force of infection depends on the number of infectives, but it also depends on susceptibles. And remember that the stock of infectives here is going to continue rising, not because it, the fact that it's rising up here doesn't mean, near the peak, doesn't mean that the number of people coming into it, the flow into it is rising. It just means the flow into it if this stock, this red stock is rising, what does it mean, ladies and gentlemen? It means what? If I is rising, what does it tell us about these flows? Inflow greater than outflow? Yeah, inflow is greater than outflow. The, the value of the incidence flow may be higher earlier, um, but that doesn't mean I will be at its peak there. The fact that I is at its peak doesn't mean that the value of this inflow is, is at its peak. It's just that as long as inflow is greater than outflow, it's gonna continue to rise, right? Um, and conversely, um, the minimum value of the stock of infectives um, is occurring at a different time than the minimum of incidence. The number of infectives will continue to decrease Number of infectives will decrease after, even if incidence is rising later, as long as the rate of recoveries is higher than the rate of infections. This is actually not so relevant in this case, but will be very, very relevant in the case of an open population where people are coming in. Okay, um, so uh, we've taken a whirlwind tour through this um, topic of infectious disease models. Infectious disease models show in a microcosm some aspects associated with nonlinearity. And you see that nonlinearity indicated directly in this multiplication of S, S times I. Now, all these principles of stocks and flows, that a value of a stock will rise as long as the inflow is greater than the outflow, flow, fall as long as the outflow is greater than the inflow, and remain, in constant, remain constant as long as the inflow equals the outflow, hold true here. Um, but now we have some added twists because of the, the presence of nonlinearity. And particularly, we can have phenomena where we have radically different behavior uh, in different areas of, um, uh, in different contexts when the system's in some different contexts. And we'll be seeing that some in the next lecture or two. But I want you to recognize here that we are dealing with um, 
uh, a system which has some defined dynamics associated with it. And the dynamics are reflected uh, in a, for a closed population in this case and for an open population um, in cases we'll be seeing in coming lectures. What governs this, uh, this red inflow or this red uh, stock uh, here and its trajectory over time are the same basic principles of stocks and flows, but with the added dynamics being associated with it of this exponential growth during parts of it caused by the, the nonlinearity uh, associated with infection. The fact that new infections are driven not just by the number of susceptibles, but by the number of infectives and the number of infectives is in a positive feedback loop. And so we have this, this uh, shifting feedback dominance. Next time, we'll be extending this to open populations where we have people coming in. And we'll see that while this dynamics gives us some indication of what to expect there, it's much more textured yet because we're dealing with the need to refill, for example, the, um, uh, the stock associated with susceptibles. And it leads to a series of outbreaks, successive waves, um, that are not unlike what we've seen in the context of COVID, unfortunately, um, and in the context every year of, um, of seasonal infections like uh, influenza or the cold, common cold. Um, but today's lecture should get you where you need to get for, uh, for Friday um, in terms of the basic understanding for exercise four. And we'll be elaborating on this further and the significance of nonlinearity um, from a bigger picture of you uh, uh, next uh, in our lecture on Thursday. In the meantime, I'll be holding office hours uh, in five minutes and I'd welcome anyone to come along and I appreciate your forum posts on questions and I'll continue to attend to them. So thanks very much.